scripture reading this morning is, um, we have two passages of scriptures today, and the first one is in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 8, verses 23 to 27. That's Matthew chapter 8, 23 to 27. It says, now when Jesus got into a boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? The next portion of scripture is in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 44 to 49. That's Luke chapter 7. 44 to 49. Then Jesus turned to the woman and said to Simon, You see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss. This woman has ceased not to kiss to kiss my feet, and since that time that I've come in, you did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Oh, good morning. Thank you, first, thank you, Angela. And a special welcome to those of you who are joining us live stream, maybe in your homes. Today, it, we can be an encouragement to you through the internet. And uh, so good, though, that we can, can meet in person and uh, have, have live encouragement. And so much of the ministry that takes place when the church gathers is from the members of the church ministering to one another. Encouragement, uh, exhortation, praying for one another, and just it's joyful being together with others who are rejoicing, and it's comforting to be together with those who will share in your, your sorrows and your, your hurts. And... Uh, Thanksgiving, we have much to thank the Lord for. I, I contemplated having a, a special topical message on Thanksgiving this morning, um, but as I was preparing, I just thought, you know, we can thank God for it all, and we do thank him for it all. Uh, so I'm going to start with Matthew chapter 1 this morning, and there's much in this that is reason and cause for thanksgiving. Uh, he is the reason what we give thanks and rejoice above all, Jesus Christ. And so we're going to start. Lord willing, we will go to the end of Matthew, not today, but in the, the months ahead, we will work our way through. Uh, Matthew is absolutely loaded with such a variety of, of uh, stories and, and doctrine and uh, events and prophecies and there's the demonic, there's the, the 
heavenly, there's angels, there's, it's, it's all in there. And so we're going to cover a lot of ground through our study of Matthew. And this morning we're going to look at the first half of chapter 1. And focus is, who is Jesus Christ? So let's bow our hearts in prayer before we begin this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for the truths we've been singing already. Thank you for this weekend that we set apart in a special way to make sure we don't forget to give thanks. But Lord, as your children, we are exhorted to give thanks always and to give thanks in every situation, knowing that our sovereign God is working in each of our lives through every situation for our good and for your glory. And Lord, as we look into your word this morning, we just ask for understanding. We ask that our eyes would be open to see the glorious truths that you have hidden and scattered through your word. And Lord, we ask that our hearts would be changed by what we read. We pray that you would stir up hope and encouragement. We pray that you would cause faith to arise. And Lord, increase our understanding of the God we worship. We recognize that so much of the trouble we get into in the false doctrine that we embrace uh, is because we have an inadequate understanding of our God and who you are. So this morning, as we look at your word, increase our understanding, correct our misunderstanding, and, and Lord, cause our hearts to rejoice and delight in you and fill our hearts with good things that we can share with others by the power of your Holy Spirit when we go out from here. As we're gathering in family gatherings and Thanksgiving meals around the table, Lord, uh, let us not be silent about you, but may our, our mouths be filled with your praises and our gratitude. And I pray for your uh, unction, that enabling of your spirit, that I might speak what you want spoken in your way, by your power. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, the book of Matthew begins with... Uh, the heading, the name of the writer. Matthew uh, is the title of this. The author of this gospel, we all know, is the Holy Spirit. God is the author of Scripture. But the writer whom God inspired and used was Matthew, one of Jesus' 12 disciples. We don't know very much about Matthew actually, other than he was a tax collector who worked for the Romans. And that's significant. He wrote one of the, the Gospels, and yet we know nothing about Matthew from reading the Gospel that he wrote. And uh, Mark called, or, sorry, Mark and Luke called him Levi, uh, which was probably his name given by his parents, uh, the name Matthew means gift of God, and it's suspected that he may have received that name from Jesus. Um, like Jesus had given Simon the name Peter, uh, many think that Jesus gave Levi the name Matthew. Gift of God, which would have been a gift for him to receive that name from Jesus, if that's what happened, because he would have been hated by the Jewish society because he was a tax collector, he was employed by the Romans, and he was considered a traitor to the Jews. Nowhere in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, do we find a single recorded word that Matthew ever spoke. In fact, the only words recorded of Jesus interacting with Matthew at all were when Jesus walked past Matthew while he was sitting in his tax collector's booth and Jesus called him to follow me. Two words. The only interaction that we hear of with Matthew between him and the Lord. And Matthew did not write to tell us about himself, but to tell us about Jesus. And the title, Matthew, I think he would have cringed to see that there. That, he did not put that title there. Uh, others have 
added that since. Um, his title was what we read in verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It's not about us, it's all about Jesus. Uh, and that was the heart of Matthew. And that should characterize our ministry too. It's not about us, it's about Jesus. Who is Jesus Christ? The, the Gospel of Matthew will give us amazing insights into who Jesus is. However, if we put all the information together about Jesus, uh, do you realize that in the New Testament, there are a total of less than 30 days of his life that are recorded for us? Less than 30 days in all of the New Testament. But, but really, as, as Matthew recognizes, it's not just the Gospels that teach us about Jesus, it's the entire Bible that teaches us about him. Uh, and Jesus himself said in Luke 24, 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures contained concerning himself. So uh, Moses goes right back to Genesis. Moses was the, the writer of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and all the prophets. Uh, Jesus says, it's all about me, all about him. He is the central figure. He is the focus. He is the subject of the Bible. And uh, therefore, Matthew begins telling us about who Jesus is by taking us back into the Old Testament. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament, and it begins with these words, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now, the, the Greek word that is translated into English as genealogy is actually the word genesis which can also be translated as origins or beginning. So the book of the Genesis of Jesus Christ. So the first book of the Old Testament is called Genesis. The first book of the New Testament begins by identifying itself also as a book of Genesis, a new book of new beginnings and a new covenant that is brought about by Jesus Christ. And who is Jesus Christ? The Old Testament is a book of promises, uh, pointing forward, making promises of a coming Messiah, while the New Testament is a book of fulfillment of Old Testament promises. In fact, the word fulfilled is one of the key words that is repeated often in Matthew's Gospel. He's going to be talking much about fulfilled prophecy, fulfilled prophecy, uh, the Gospel of Matthew is written as a natural transition from the Old Testament into the New Testament because it begins by going back into the Old and, and tracing the history and transitioning into uh, the New Testament. Matthew was a Jew, and he wrote this Gospel to a primarily Jewish audience. It's the most Jewish of the four Gospels that we have. And it's important for us to keep this in mind when uh, we are interpreting this gospel, and particularly as we, as we move along, there's going to be times where we're going to have to remind ourselves this is a Jewish book written to Jewish people. That's the focus. That's the perspective. Matthew portrays Jesus Christ as king, tracing his genealogy back through the, Lord, the royal lineage of King David, Fifty-four times, Matthew talks about the kingdom and repeatedly identifies Jesus Christ as the king of the kingdom. One of the objectives of this gospel of Matthew is to demonstrate and confirm that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies concerning the expected king of Israel, the Messiah. Jesus fulfilled the prophecies. Repeatedly, we will read Matthew making the statement, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. Or this fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet. That phrase, that expression will be repeated throughout Matthew. Someone has counted 333 prophecies in the Old Testament about the, the person coming and ministry of the Messiah. 
And it has been calculated that the mathematical chances of all these 333 uh, prophecies being fulfilled by one person are one in 83 billion is the chance that one person would by chance fulfill all of those prophecies. And yet, defying all odds, these prophecies are fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? He is the fulfillment of all that was prophesied um, about the Messiah, about the coming King, about the son of, of David, the son of Abraham, the son of God. Um, all that was prophesied through the Old Testament, he is the fulfillment. Do you realize that we have, therefore, a more compelling reason to believe in the death, resurrection of Jesus Christ than simply because the New Testament said that this happened? That's, that's a tremendous reason to believe it. The New Testament said it happened, but even more compelling is to be able to look through the Old Testament and see that, that for centuries before, it said, that is going to happen, that is going to happen. That is going to happen. And then have the New Testament say, it did, it did, it did. Jesus did it. He fulfilled it. The New Testament is the good news that the promises of the old have been fulfilled just as God said they would be. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Jesus Christ is the, the goal and the climax of the Old Testament history. And the focus of the Old Testament is primarily pointing us again and again to Jesus Christ. It's all about him. And Matthew helps us to see this. The first chapter of Matthew describes some very unusual events, and we're not going to be getting into those just yet this morning. Um, next week we will be seeing... There is a virgin who is pregnant. An angel appears to tell a young man to marry this virgin mother. The angel names the child. His name shall be Jesus. And the angel declares that this child will save his people from their sins. So who is this Jesus? Many would ask that question throughout his lifetime. We already read this morning, a storm threatens to capsize a boat drowning everyone on board. Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves, and they instantly become calm, and his disciples see it, and they ask, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. He forgives sins, and the bystanders ask, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he enters Jerusalem on a donkey, and the crowd traveling with him lay their coats and palm branches on the, the road before him as they call out, Hosanna to the son of David. And the rest of the city asks, who is this? If we don't understand who Jesus is, we may very well respond like the skeptics in Nazareth who rejected his teaching because though they were acquainted with him, they recognized him. They'd seen him around. They had no idea who Jesus really was. And in Matthew 13, verse 54, the Bible says that when he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished. And they said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And so they were offended at him because they didn't understand who he was. They thought that Jesus was a good man, but nothing more than a local carpenter. And therefore, what he says was not taken very seriously. Matthew witnessed all of that. Matthew saw the response of people to, to Jesus. And therefore, the whole Gospel of Matthew, right from the beginning, is written to answer the question, who is Jesus? 
in order to put your faith in him, you need to understand and know just who this guy is. So beginning with the very first verse, Matthew 1, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus. The name Jesus means Savior. Christ, meaning Messiah, the Anointed One. The Son of David, the Son of Abraham. Notice that Jesus is not introduced as a Son of David. David had many sons. Not introduced as a son of Abraham. Abraham had many descendants, but the son of these men. How can he be the son of David and the son of Abraham? Um, it's important that he is introduced, though, as the son. David was the, the father of the, the Jewish royal family. Abraham he was the father of all the Jewish people. God had promised each of these men separately that they would each have a son through whom God would accomplish some amazing things. But both of their immediate sons were failures. Now Matthew says, this Jesus who I am introducing you to is He's related to Abraham, so he's a son of Abraham. He's related to David, so he's a son of David. But he comes as the son of both David and Abraham. He is the fulfillment of God's promises to these men. So in Genesis chapter 12, let's look at some of the promises that God made. Genesis chapter 12. In verse 7, God made a number of promises to, to Abraham, and we're just going to pick some of the highlights. At verse 7, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, literally to your seed, singular, I will give this land. Galatians chapter 3, 16 in the New Testament clarifies that saying to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, plural, as to many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. So Paul clarifies that for us in Galatians 3.16. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came to Abram, saying, one who will come from your own body shall be your heir and will inherit the land and the blessings that I am promising you. All that I am giving to you, Abraham, all I am promising to you, it's going to be inherited by your seed from your own body. Speaking of the promised offspring of Abraham, the Lord said in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, back to chapter 12, Verse 2 and 3, he said, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, i.e. in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, in Matthew chapter 1, Verse 1, verse 2, begin with Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and so on. But Abraham's son Isaac showed very little sign of fulfilling the promises of greatness. He showed very little sign of bringing blessing to all the families of the earth. And neither did his son, Jacob, um, and, or his sons, Jacob and Esau. They didn't bring much blessing to the families of the earth. And various twists and turns uh, bring the book of Genesis to its close. And at the end of the book of Genesis, the family of Jacob, having left the land that God promised to them, 
left it to live in Egypt. And in the 400 years between the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus, the descendants of Abraham have become slaves in Egypt. They are used and they are abused by their masters. And something appears to have gone terribly wrong. This is not being a great nation. In fact, they were not a nation whom those who bless are blessed by and those who curse are cursed by. It's not happening. What is the problem? But two men were promised a son. We've looked at, at Abraham, and Jesus is the fulfillment of both of those promises. Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of the Jews, and David was the father of the royal line of kings. David also had been promised a very special son, 2 Samuel. We read about that in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And verse 12 to 14. God is speaking to Samuel, or sorry, speaking through to David through prophet and said to David, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed, singular, after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house or a temple for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son." Profound promise. The promised son would build a temple and his kingdom would never end. Now Solomon followed David to the throne. He became a king. and He built a temple in Jerusalem. But both his kingdom and the temple that he built, um, the rituals associated with it, became increasingly corrupt and increasingly displeasing to God, so that in 586 BC, God sent the Babylonian army to destroy it all. Both the kingdom and the temple were wiped out. And all that God had promised seemed to come to nothing again. Now, there were great times in the history of the Jews, for all of the good years. There were even more years, however, marked by failure and disappointment, with very few nations around experiencing much blessing from their relationship with Israel. The people of Israel were the right people. Those were the people that God was speaking about. Those were the people of whom God was making promises. He'd spoken and made promises to Abraham and to, to David that they would be the kingdom, but they were completely powerless to fulfill their destiny. As you read through the history of the Old Testament, they tried, they tried to establish and to expand the kingdom. They tried to secure the kingdom. They tried to make it happen, but they failed. And they failed and they failed. So turning back to Matthew chapter 1, let me jump ahead for, for a minute um, to verse 17. In, in the genealogy that Matthew writes, it's verses 2 to 16, he writes a long list of, of names of the ancestors of Jesus. Um, he divides this list of names into three major sections. Verse 17 uh, tells us this. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. So there's three uh, divisions that Matthew puts into this genealogy. When you read this genealogy of names, uh, there's just names that are listed. 
But for someone who knows the history, who knows the Old Testament, each one of those names, if you pause and think about each name, beginning with Abraham, you can recall to your mind history, stories, events uh, associated with Abraham. And then there's Isaac, and you, you pause, and the history and the events that come in, into your mind about who was Isaac, what did he do, and then Jacob, and all the stories of Jacob, the cheat. And, and, and you go through each one of them, for a Jewish audience who knew their Bible, each one of those names is a story. So Matthew chapter 1, for one who pauses and meditates on this and thinks through the significance of each name, he, he leads you, he walks you right through the entire Old Testament history of Israel. Now, in preparing for this, I was, I was really trying hard to uh, write a little bit about each name, and we were going to quickly go through the history and my stack of pages. <laughs> I thought, okay, uh, that's, that's going to be hard to do this morning. Um, so I'm just going to pick out some highlights from it. A major portion of the first third of their history included 400 years spent in Egypt as slaves. So 400 year chunk of that first third of names was spent as slaves outside of the land of promise. The major portion of the second part of their history included 400 years wasted in idolatry pursuing other gods, being a blessing to no one. And then the last third of their history included 400 years again of silence from God in which there were no prophets, there were no teachers, there was no kings, there were no miracles, there was nothing from God. It was as if God had abandoned them. And they lived it entirely under the oppression of foreign powers. No kingdom, no king. And it seemed that God had forgotten all of his promises to Abraham and to David. The promise to Abraham of a son through whom all the nations of the world would be blessed would never find its fulfillment until the seed of Abraham came and did something so astounding that whoever in the world believed in him and what he did would not perish but be blessed with abundant and everlasting life. And the promise to David of a son who would build an eternal temple and an everlasting kingdom would only find its fulfillment in a son who called God Father and who would be known as the Son of God and who would build a living temple of eternal life that would never perish and establish a kingdom that would last forever. And now, says Matthew, against this background of the failure of Abraham's descendants to fulfill their destiny and the failure of David's descendants to fulfill their destiny, Matthew says, I want to introduce you to Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham. And the son of Abraham through whom all the promises of God would find their fulfillment, is not Isaac, it's not Jacob, but it's Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham. And everything that God promised to Abraham, and which Israel had failed to experience, is going to find its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. In verse 2, the 16 of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, tracing his family line all the way back to Abraham. Matthew's genealogy does not list all of the names in Jesus' ancestral line. There are a few gaps, and sometimes jumping from a grandfather to a great-grandson. And the Greek word that is translated into English as uh, begot, so-and-so begot so-and-so, or in some translations, so-and-so was the father of so-and-so can also mean that he was the grandfather or the great-grandfather. The word that is used in, in Greek can mean a father 
grandfather, great grandfather, great great grandfather. Uh, it simply means was the ancestor of. And so, for example, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, Rahab was a Canaanite prostitute living in Jericho. Jericho was a cursed city under the curse of God. It was to be destroyed, wiped out everything in it, destroyed. But Rahab put her faith in the God of Israel and hid a couple of Israelite spies. And the Lord saved her from being destroyed in the fall of Jericho, and she married uh, Solomon. Not Solomon, but Solomon. Verse 5 there, S-A-L-M-O-N. And the verse says that Solomon begot Boaz by Rahab. But there was well over a hundred years, probably close to 150 years between Rahab and Boaz. And therefore, Solomon would not have been Boaz's father, but his grandfather or even great-grandfather. And Boaz married a Moabite woman named Ruth. And think of the significance, the story of Ruth and Boaz, how they met and how they married. And the picture of their relationship pointed to Jesus Christ. The picture of Rahab pointed to Jesus Christ. All of these names point to Jesus Christ. Abraham, think of him sacrificing Isaac on the altar, pointing to Jesus Christ. Every one of these names in here, in one way or another, is pointing forward to Jesus Christ, who is the fulfillment. And Boaz and Ruth had a grandson named Jesse, who was the father of David who became the king of Israel. And this completes the first set of 14 generations listed, spanning from Abraham to David. Ascending from Abraham, a man without children, when the promises were made, uh, alone, solitary figure, um, and a wife who was barren. God made promises and you now have David, who is the great king of the kingdom of the Jews. And, and so here are these two men and the promises that were made, and yet their sons are not fulfilling the promises because their sons were not the son that God was pointing to. The next set of 14 generations traces all of the, the kings of the United Nation of Israel through the downward spiral of the nation as it divided into two, Israel and Judah, and two fighting nations in conflict with each other, through the terrible deepening unfaithfulness of idolatry that their kings led them into, until finally God all but wipes out the nation, he destroys the temple, he ends the kingdom, and David was the first of the kings in this lineage of kings, and his son Solomon uh, built the temple. And then Josiah, who's listed in verse 10, was the last of the, the free kings before the Babylonian captivity. And again, there are 14 generations of kings listed from David until uh, Josiah. And then the first of Jesus' ancestors to go into captivity was Jeconiah in verse 11. And from Jeconiah and the captivity in Babylon until the Christ, there are another 14 generations. And so Matthew 1.17 says, So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. Though this genealogy is accurate in that every name mentioned is a relative of Jesus Christ and they are in a line, it's not an exhaustive list of all of his relatives. Matthew intentionally arranged the list in three groups of 14 to make memorizing easier. It was something they, they did back then. They memorized 
uh, much of the, the scripture. They memorized genealogies. These names meant something to them. And you memorize this genealogy, and you've got at your fingertips, if you've memorized it, a chronological order of the history of Israel. But he also had symbolic purposes for arranging it into groups of 14. There is amazing symbolism in the numbers, and there's significance in the meaning of the names and the order of the names of the people. And we don't have time, and I don't have the brains, the understanding to be able to dive into that study of the symbolism, I would be leading you into all kinds of heresy and false doctrine. Uh, <laughs> but there's a lot there. And one day we will sit at the feet of Jesus Christ and he's going to explain to us what all of this meant and what it means. And I'd encourage you to dive into it. You can, you can get nuggets, you can get bits and pieces um, David, the name David has a numerical value of 14. And you got 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. 14 is repeated in there. There's significance to it. The name of David is twice used in this chronology. And um, there's something about David. And uh, we can get into a, a whole study on the significance of David and how he was one of the greatest types of Jesus Christ, pointing to Christ. And so anyhow, you know, um, many unique features about this family record. One is that it makes mention of five women. And anyone who studies ancient uh, genealogies, and particularly Hebrew genealogies, it's very unusual for women to be mentioned in a genealogy because the family lineage and inheritance was always traced through the men. At least three of these women were Gentiles, very possibly four of them that are mentioned um, of the five. There's five women who are mentioned. So at least three of them were not Jews. So they... They have been imported into the, the, the kingdom, into the family line. Tamar, first of these, was a Canaanite who seduced her father-in-law, Judah. And through that uh, incestuous relationship bore twins, one of whom was an ancestor of Jesus Christ, as was Judah. Rahab, second Name woman mentioned was a Canaanite prostitute living in Jericho, a cursed city that was to be wiped out because of its extreme wickedness. And in this extremely wicked city, she had an extreme occupation as a prostitute in that city. But she found grace, she found mercy, and was added to the family line of Jesus. Ruth was a Moabitess. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 23, there's an interesting statement. The people of Moab were placed under a curse because they hired Balaam. Remember, we studied Balaam to curse the people of Israel. And God said, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. Balaam was hired by the Moabites to curse Israel. Um, the people of Israel, and in response for that, Deuteronomy 23.3 says, uh, God speaking, an, um, Ammon, sorry, an Ammonite or Moabite, and Ruth was a Moabite, shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever. How did she get in? under that kind of a curse. The assembly of the Lord meant to be given full status as an Israelite, uh, to be given citizenship, full citizenship. Ruth was part of a cursed nation of people that was banned from ever being given full citizen status, and yet she was included in the genealogy of King David, and she was a great-grandmother of Jesus Christ. Bathsheba 
Uriah's wife. Uh, Uriah was a Hittite, suggesting that she also may have been a Hittite, not a Jew. And as a result of his lust for her, David committed both adultery with her and murder of her husband. And so why are these four women singled out and included in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, why didn't they include Sarah? Why didn't they include Rebecca, Rachel? Why didn't they include some of these other godly women who aren't mentioned at all in here? The Bible doesn't answer that question, but it would seem that in introducing us to the promised son, the promised king, the Lord is also giving us a glimpse into who is making up the kingdom. Who is this son coming to save? Who is he the savior of? When you become part of the family of God, in Christ, barriers of all kind are, are broken down. In the kingdom of God, social barriers are broken down. There is no Jew, there is no Gentile. In the kingdom of God, sexist barriers are broken down. Barriers that would stand between women being able to uh, receive the blessings and enter into the inheritance. Sin barriers of the worst kind are broken down when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And the curse of sin is broken down through Jesus Christ. And the outcasts and the respectable are both brought together in their common relationship with Jesus Christ. So we read in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 to 29, the New Testament. Galatians 3, 26. For you all are sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Loaded with promise, loaded with fulfillment, loaded with blessing for you who have put your faith in the Son of God, put your faith in the Son of David. This is a lineage in Matthew chapter 1, a lineage of grace. A Savior had been promised, a great Son, a Messiah. A great king who would bring blessing not only to his own people, but to the nations of the world. That though Abraham and David had many descendants, none of those in the lineage were successful in fulfilling the promises, including Mary, who was born into a line of sinners. And all of those in Jesus' lineage, including Mary, were in need of a savior. Look at Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1 and verse 46. We have a statement of Mary's when she is informed that she's going to have a son who's going to be the Messiah, the son, the fulfillment. She says in verse 46, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. She was part of that lineage. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name can echo that. On this Thanksgiving Sunday, we can say, thank you, Father, for loving me. And thank you for sending your Son 
for me, that I might be saved, that I might be included in your lineage of grace, that I might be included in this family of grace, this great family of God. And finally, in verse 16, of Matthew chapter 1, we are brought up to the time of Jesus Christ. It says, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Notice the pattern changes. If you're reading through all the names, it's so-and-so begot so-and-so, who begot so-and-so, or was the father of so-and-so, was the father of. And for the first time in this entire list of names, you get to the last one. The Bible does not say that Joseph begat or that Joseph was the father of Jesus. The Bible is very precise in saying that Jesus was born of Mary, implying that Joseph was not the biological father. It doesn't say he was the father. It skips that and says he was the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. One of the reasons that the Hebrew genealogies always trace the ancestry through the name, the reason the Bible, or, or through the man, the reason the Bible traces the ancestry through the man is because the Adamic sin nature is passed on through the man and not through the woman. We did not inherit our sin nature from our mothers. Can't blame your mom. We inherited it through our fathers. Mother inherited her sin nature from her father, but my mom did not pass it on to me. My dad did. It is through the man that the sin nature is passed down from generation to generation. Therefore, the significance of that, Jesus Christ did not inherit a sin nature because he did not have a human father, as we will see next week. And Mary could not pass on her sin nature, which she had. You don't have to come up with some invented idea that Mary... Uh, was perpetually a virgin, um, or that Mary was immaculate, sinless. You don't need to do that. She could not pass her sin nature on. This genealogy shows that Joseph, the adoptive father of Jesus, was in the direct line of the kings of Judah. So by adoption, Jesus was placed into the kingly line of David. But there's another genealogy in Luke's gospel, which is believed to be Mary's genealogy, and she also is a direct descendant of King David. And so both by birth and by adoption, Jesus was the son of David. Now it's, we're going to have to have to wrap up here, but uh, a little interesting side note that I think more than the side note, it's significant. Uh, there is no Jew alive today, at least as far as I know, no Jew alive today who can trace their lineage back to King David to demonstrate that they are the son of David. Only Jesus Christ can do that. He can. He can trace his lineage back to David. And the Antichrist will not be able to show that he is of the lineage of David. Only Jesus can trace his lineage back to show that he indeed is the son of David. And as we're going to see next week, only Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, conceived of the Holy Spirit, and was declared to be the Son of God, the Son of Abraham, the Son of David. And he is King of all kings. He is Lord of all lords. He is our Savior. He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our thanks. And so, Father, we do thank you for sending your son, Jesus. And we thank you for this 
quick look at the origins of Jesus, where he comes from, who he is. And Father, we, we pray that you would cause us to rejoice and to give thanks. And as we said at the beginning, Lord, increase our faith in you. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning for any who have not put their faith in you, who are not part of the family of God. Lord, I pray that you would cause within their hearts faith to arise in you and cause them to cry out to you, as even Mary did, acknowledging that I need a Savior. I need you, Jesus, to save me from my sin, to save me from my failure. Lord, I am powerless to control my destiny and my future. I see my life slipping away, and I cannot control it. I do not know where I am going. I do not have hope. Lord, I pray that you would cause such one to cry out to you, that you would transfer them out of the kingdom of darkness into the family of God. I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.